Well, we're continuing our exploration of the book of Jonah. And whenever we enter the Word of God, we should do it with a word of prayer. So let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We pray, Father, that you would just use this coming hour to open our hearts and lives to your Word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would just guide us as we seek to gain the lessons that you have for us here in this unusual book. As we commit the coming hour and ourselves into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our coming King indeed. Amen. The book of Jonah. Some people say a whale of a tale. Others might say maybe it was just a cameo appearance. But in any case, we're going to jump right into chapter 2 of the book of Jonah. Some people find this book hard to swallow. Is it real? Is it just a legend, a myth, an allegory? Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, sagas like the Iliad by Homer. We have Moby Dick by uh, Herman Melville, uh, the story of Robinson Crusoe. These are cherished stories that are in our background, but we, regard, we don't regard them as serious. They're just fiction. Is the book of Jonah in that category just a mythical uh, uh, book? Is it an allegory of the Jews in a sea of nations or what have you? Some people would say so. Is it actually historic? And indeed it is, because we have no one less than the, Je- and then the Lord Jesus Christ authenticated for us. There are certain books that Satan hates. They're really special targets. And Genesis, of course, is one of them. Uh, Jonah is another, and so is Daniel. Genesis really is the foundation for the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 3 lays the, is the seed plot for the whole Bible. Critical book. In many ways, and of course, it's, uh, singled out by Satan for attacks of all kinds. Many people don't regard it seriously, and indeed they should. Um, we have the book of Jonah, which deals with the resurrection of Christ. It's a testimony of his resurrection. He said so. He pointed to it in that regard. And of course, the book of Daniel very popular because it deals uh, particularly with the second coming of Jesus Christ. So most prophecy buffs are... Uh, get some real expertise in the book of Daniel. These are three books that Satan hates because they bear fruit for the kingdom. And so, but the authenticity is the uh, key issue here. Jesus recognized the historic, historicity of Jonah and his personal reference to his the personal existence of Jonah, the miraculous fate of Jonah, and the prophetical office of Jonah are all explicitly asserted in Matthew 12 uh, and Luke 11. Uh, he called them uh, Jonah a prophet. He authenticates his office as a prophet, Jesus himself. Uh, he assented to the miracle of Jonah's recovery from the fish. Jesus himself attested to this. Doesn't get any stronger than that. And of course, he even based his call to repentance in his day on the validity of Jonah's message of repentance in, in, uh, uh, historically. Now, there's specific objections to the story that we will deal with as we review the text, particularly here in this chapter. So, there are a number of provocative paradoxes uh, here. Um, It seemed strange to Kimchi, a Jew himself, one of the the rabbinical sources, that the book of Jonah is even among the scriptures, because the only prophecy it concerns is Nineveh, a heathen city, and makes no mention of Israel. The fact that it makes no mention of Israel uh, is uh, is referred to... uh, uh, by every other prophet. And uh, so th- the reason seems to be that it's a tacit reproof of Israel, in effect. Uh, it, that, in fact, that seems intended. A heathen people were ready to repent at the first preaching of the prophet, who was a stranger to them, but Israel, who boasted of, of being of God's elect, something else. Uh, the, the Ninevites were repented. Uh, that's that's going to be the biggest miracle that we'll encounter in chapter 3, even though Jonah was a stranger to them. That's in contrast to Israel itself, who boasted of being God's elect, but they did not repent, even though they were warned by their own prophets at all seasons. And so, uh, also in a dispensational sense, uh, this may be an anticipatory peak, if you will, of the light to lighten the Gentiles that Luke 2 talks about and that Isaiah spends uh, efforts on. So, there may may be uh, be an allegory in that sense. But Joseph, Jonah himself is a paradox in himself. He's a prophet of God, and yet he was a runaway from God. He was a man drowned, 
Yet he's alive. He's a preacher of repentance, and he's one that repines at repentance, as we'll discover in chapter 4. So yet Jonah was saved from the jaws of death himself. On repentance, he was the most fit to give hope to Nineveh, doomed though it was, of a merciful respite of repentance. So the patience and pity of God stands in striking contrast with the selfishness and hard-heartedness of man. Indeed, in many respects, the book of Jonah is the, presents the God of the second chance. The key person in the book of Jonah is not Jonah. It's God himself. He's the principal one we focus on here. So we get, the la at last, last time we were together was in chapter 1, it closed with verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. So it was apparently a very special fish of some kind. The Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. A very specific period of time in God's program as Jesus attests to in, in uh, Matthew 12 and so on. So, uh, so this is the, the fact that Jesus attests to this really should eliminate any doubts or concerns we have about uh, the validity or the historicity of the book of Jonah. And uh, so this was all undertaken uh, uh, on our behalf. The story of Jonah was for our benefit. And we want to keep that in mind as we go here. The great fish, the word in the Hebrew is dag, which means fish, like Dagon, if you will. Uh, when, that's, when the Old Testament is translated into Greek, uh, it, the word was ketos, and that's also the word used in the New Testament, Greek, which is a term in Greek which means a large sea creature. Was it a whale? Was it some, uh, some large fish? Or was it a special fish of some kind? We don't know. But clearly the Lord had prepared it in any case, and that, that's the end of it, in a sense. And we notice that in the definition of gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, by way of review, that uh, the three elements that make up the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, is fundamental. And it's echoed all through the Old Testament, and uh, this is perhaps the most conspicuous case of it. Which Scriptures? It, you know, Paul mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, according to the Scriptures, he is alluding there to the Old Testament. That was the scriptures he had in hand. The third day shows up in Genesis chapter 1 because new life begins on the third day. At Cana, in, in the second chapter of the Gospel of John, the wedding at Cana was on the day of double blessing, the day what we would call Tuesday. That's why Jewish weddings are usually on Tuesday. And uh, Abraham's offering of Isaac involved Isaac being dead to Abraham for three days until he's restored, of course, in the substitution on the top of uh, uh, Golgotha. And, uh, but there's another e echo I'd like to acquaint you with, since I think we have space for it in this, in this uh, session. And that is something that many people may not be aware of unless they've done a very careful study of the, Greek, of the Hebrew text. And that's the court of Rahab. And uh, you may recall in Joshua chapter 2, the two spies are sent. They're received by Rahab the harlot. Uh, and she uh, uh, hid them uh, so that they could do the reconnoitering and so forth. But then in verse 15 it says, she let them down by a cord through the window. In other words, to escape the search that was going on for them. She let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And so the word there, cord, that she uses happens to be the Hebrew word chebel, which means cord, rope, or some kind of measuring line. But it happens also to be the same word means pain, sorrow, or travail. It's, it can be used as a pun in that sense. Okay. Well, the spies then point out to her, they, they say in response, they say, Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou lettest down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. In other words, the, the spies here are promising her uh, a, an asylum, if you will. If she would get her family together, uh, and it'll be marked by that scarlet thread, that they'll, the, the troops will be instructed to spare them. They'll wipe out the rest, but they'll spare uh, Rahab and her family. And so they use the term here, a different word. They say, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window. The word they happen to use is the word tikva in the Hebrew, uh, which has the meaning of a cord. 
just like the other word did, except tikva also can be used in a different sense as a word for hope, things hoped for, or an outcome. In fact, ha tikva, the tikva, is the national anthem of Israel. There, of course, it means their hope, or things hoped for. And so here are these two different words for cord that are separated, one in verse 15, one in 18. Between these two, she has said to them, get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may ye go your way. In other words, she tells them, don't go direct, go hide in the mountains for three days uh, before you head home. That's her advice. But interesting, as you study the text there, as a rabbi would, there are two words, chebel, which can mean pain, sorrow, or travail, and tikva, which means hope or things hoped for, and these two extremes are separated by three days. And if a, 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 a rabbi might call this a remez, a hint of something deeper, it has a, a, a mystery, mystery value, if you will, and uh, this uh, can be viewed uh, by people who take the text very seriously as a, a, an anticipatory echo of the events of uh, not only Jonah, but of course, but of the cross at Golgotha. And we'll discover that Jesus Christ is on every page of the Old Testament in some way or another. And uh, whenever you see something, an, ec an extra detail in a story, a uh, rabbi will call that a remez. It says, sir, dig here, there's a treasure hidden. It's a hint of something deeper. And so this is a remez, if you will, of uh, Jonah. If you, if you see it. If not, don't worry about it. Let's move on. The biggest one of the list, of course, the most conspicuous one is Jonah and the great fish as an anticipatory uh, uh, sign of the, 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 the cross and the resurrection, simply because Jesus points to it so crisply in those passages. And so it shouldn't surprise us that Satan attacks this book, especially it's the most maligned book of the Bible in that sense. Now, you may be surprised to learn that there have been reports of this kind of event occurring. In February of 1891, a whaler by the name of James Bartley was on a ship called Star of the East near the Falcon Islands, and he was lost while they were chasing a sperm whale. The crew caught the and killed the whale, and they found Bartley inside, unconscious but still alive. And he recovered in three weeks, resumed his duties, his skin bleached white, like uh, parchment. And that's uh, recorded in uh, the Parvel's journal and uh, is a matter of a, a apparent record. Now, there's another case when an English sailor fell overboard and was swallowed by a fish. A day or two later, the fish was seen floating on the surface of the water, was taken ashore, and when it was opened up, the sailors found their shipmate alive. And he survived the experience, but his skin had turned a chalky white and remained so for the rest of his life. And Dr. Harry Rimmer, who's written a series of books, they're in my library, uh, talked with him and learned the details of his experience. So these are records, and there are probably others, and we don't accept the book of Jonah because of these reports. We find these reports rather interesting, but uh, there's another perspective that I might share with you, and that's one of naval submarines. I had the privilege of uh, visiting the first nuclear submarine, the Nautilus, and uh, it was launched in 1954. Uh, it went to New London, Connecticut, and then from there to San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, it went 1,350 miles in about 84 hours. Uh, in 1958, it made history by being a, a first undersea transit of the North Pole under the ice. And uh, so that is just a matter of, uh, as a Naval Academy graduate, I have to weave these into the story. And today, of course, ballistic missile submarines carry a crew of uh, 163, and they uh, hold them under sea for months at a time. Sometimes they'll go 400,000 miles without refueling. And uh, so if a group of engineers and technicians can fabricate a vessel to accomplish all of that, why should we, should we be so skeptical that the God of the universe uh, can't prepare a great fish, a fish for his own purposes? And of course, when you put it in that perspective, it's... it's, uh, it's uh, a silly form of skepticism, in my view. And so, but in any case, let's you and I move on to the first couple of verses of uh, this strange chapter, chapter 2 of the book of Jonah. Uh, Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, this is what he said, 
I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Now the word there for hell is Sheol, and that is not a word for the grave. That's a word for the, the uh, domain of the departed spirits. In the Hebrew, it's Sheol. In the, in the Greek, it would be Hades. Out of the bell of Hades cried I. I could argue from this text that Jonah apparently died and uh, will be resurrected, of course, in the same manner that Lazarus was uh, in John 11. But uh, let's move on here. The, the word hell uh, is the word that it gets widely misused in English. In the scripture, there are five words that are rendered in English hell. One of them is Sheol, that's a Hebrew word. There's a Greek equivalent word called Hades. And uh, they're both, uh, 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 for our purposes, synonymous. There's also a word that Jesus used, Gehenna. And there's a word also we encounter in, in the New Testament, the Abuso. And there's also a word that occurs only once in the Bible, the word Tartarus. We only explore a little bit these five words because they're paramount in terms of understanding our own destiny. And uh, the King James Version, hell, is an English word that originally derived from the Saxon term helan, which means to cover. Hence, it, com it means that is covered or the invisible place. It comes to mean the invisible place in the Old English. And uh, the, word, it's trans the words are translated hell 53 times, 32 in the Old Testament, 21 in the New. In the Old Testament, the word is typically Sheol. Uh, in the New Testament, it's Hades. And in a couple of cases, the word Gehenna. Those are always translated to hell, but they're, they mean very different things. And uh, 11 of the 12 times of Gehenna is by the Lord himself. So the Lord uses that term uh, surprisingly frequently. But let's start with the word Sheol in the Hebrew. It, uh, does, it's not the grave. The grave is the destination of the body. A body gets put in the grave. The departed soul goes to a place which is called in the Hebrew Sheol. They're different. The location of departed souls, the abode of the dead, both good and bad. It's not necessarily a bad place or a good place. It's the, de it's the departed souls of the dead. And uh, the first occurrence occurs in Genesis 37 by Jacob. He assumes that his son, who is reported dead, will be conscious after death and he would be united with him. That's his conception. He could not mean grave because the incident that's alluded to here would imply being devoured by an animal, which there is no grave. Uh, he was still his son, and he still retained his identity. It's a very key biblical concept, every place that occurs. Uh, go down implies, it may be just rhetorical, but it implies a geocentric metaphor, even if it's even as a metaphor. And uh, Now, the word grave is kiver. It's the opposite. It's not synonymous with Sheol. Kiver is the grave. Uh, Sheol is never translated in Menema, or always Hades, and always contrasted, never equated. And Sheol is under the earth, underworld, lower parts of the earth. Sepulchers were above the earth or in caves. They're very different. So it dis distinguish the difference between a grave and Sheol. And it's also the opposite of heaven, of course. And uh, so the verb kabar means to bury. It's never used of Sheol. Uh, Kiver can be pluralized. They can speak of graves in the plural. Sheol is never pluralized. Uh, pluralized. A grave is located as a specific site. Sheol is never localized. It's accessible at death no matter where death takes place. Wherever you die, the soul goes to Sheol. There's no grave necessary to go to Sheol. And uh, so one can purchase or sell a grave. Sheol is never spoken of as being purchased or sold. You can own a grave as a personal property. Nowhere is Sheol owned by a man. Bodies are unconscious in the grave. Those that are in Sheol are conscious. Very, very important difference. In the Old Testament, Isaiah 14 and 44 and Ezekiel 31 and 32. And of course, most of what we know about these topics come out of Luke 16 from the Lord himself. So Sheol occurs in the uh, Old Testament 65 times, derived from a root word meaning to ask or demand. So the word tends to imply insatiableness. 
Sheol is never full, the Proverbs tell us. It's rendered grave 31 times, but that's misleading. It's rendered hell 31 times in the King James Version. It's the place of the disembodied spirits. And uh, the inhabitants of Sheol are the congregation of the dead. Uh, it's the abode of the wicked dead on the one hand, but it's also the, uh, the abode of the good dead. In Psalm 16 and 30 and 49 and 86, in the Psalms especially. Sheol is described as deep in Job 11. It is dark in, in Job 10. And it's with bars in Job 17. The, the dead go down to it. So the, the, it, again, idiomatically, has a geocentric flavor here. Now, shifting to the Greek term, which is essentially equivalent, Hades. In classic Greek, Hades or Pluto is the god of the lower regions in their conception. Orcus was their term for the netherworld, the realm of the dead. In biblical Greek, we find the, uh, uh, Hades refers to the infernal reason, regions, a dark and dismal place in the very depths of the earth, the common receptacle of disembodied spirits. Make the distinction the, for the bodies and the spirits. Very different. And uh, again, idiomatically, Hades is geocentric in its concept. At least rhetorically, it's viewed as being down in the earth somewhere. Um, and so the word Hades is the Greek word for what's out of sight. It denotes the place of the dead. It's translated hell 11 times in the New Testament. The Septuagint, the translation into Greek of the Old Testament, Hades is used to translate the Hebrew word Sheol, and uh, it's the place of the dead on 61 different occasions. So we're uh, on sound scholarship to regard them as synonymous, Sheol in the Hebrew, Hades in the Greek. And uh, Hades is associated in Greek with the Orcus, the infernal regions, the dark and dismal place in the very depths of the earth, the common receptacle of disembodied spirits. But in Greek conceptions, it had two subterranean divisions, Elysium and Tartarus. Elysium was analogous to what we think of as heaven, and uh, Tartarus was the, the, the worst of all possible places. We'll come to that word specifically at the end of our little vocabulary exercise here. So Hades refers to the abode of the unsaved dead prior to the great white throne, son, at the great white throne judgment Everything changes in Revelation 20, verse 11. We'll get to there. Uh, Hades is a prison. It has gates and bars and locks, according to Matthew 16 and Revelation 1. It is downward. It's earth geocentric again. And the righteous and the wicked are separated in Hades. They're both there, but separated. That's the key concept here. Now, we'll come back to that, but I want to introduce another term that gets confused with all of these called Gehenna. And uh, it's a word that the Lord uses. Now, it's, the word derives originally from the Valley of Hinnom that was south of Jerusalem, and it was where the filth and the dead animals of the city were cast out and burned. So it's constantly smoking and burning that was the, the, they were familiar with. And so out of that idiom, the word Gehenna is, is crafted, which refers to an eternal lake of fire that's the ultimate destiny of the unsaved that are temporarily held in Hades of Sheol. The unsaved are temporarily held in Hades or Sheol. And uh, the Hinnom Valley afterwards became uh, the city dump. Uh, the, the fire was continually burning. It became an idiom to speak of the place of everlasting fire and burning. And it's used by the Lord 11 times in that sense, the word Gehenna. And uh, all through the, the Gospels, you find the lake that burns with fire and brimstone is another way it's translated. I want to underscore the difference between Hades and Gehenna. Both are translated hell in your English Bible, but that's confusing. Hades is a temporary place. In Revelation 20, verse 14, Hades itself will be cast into Gehenna. So Hades is, temp is temporary. Uh, it apparently is, in, at least idiomatically, in the earth, geocentric. And uh, it's associated with the bottomless pit, the Abuso, which we'll talk about in a minute. Gehenna, in contrast to Hades, is forever. It's permanent. No, it never ends. I want to underscore an error that many of we've made for years, and I know many people still make, that Gehenna is not referred to when we encounter the phrase, the outer darkness. And it occurs three times in the Gospel of Matthew. The outer darkness is used idiomatically for a totally different thing that goes beyond our scope here right now. It's a, a, and we deal with that in our Matthew commentary. It's, a, it's analogous to being in the house of God, but not in the presence of the Shekinah. 
in, in outer, the darkness that's outside. It's, it's, a mistran it's a strange Greek construction. It's mistranslated in the English Bible in, 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 the, in the authorized version. So it, it is picked up in the modern versions, such as the uh, International Standard Version. It's the darkness outside of a particular context. It does not refer to Gehenna, as most people presume, and that causes other, another form of confusion. But I want to talk about this word Tartarus. And it's another word that's translated hell, but only once. It only occurs once, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. It's a, wor a, wor a Greek term referring to the deepest abyss of Hades. In Homer's Iliad, it is regarded as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. That's their way of expressing how uh, the huge difference between Tartarus and, and Hades in the normal sense. As far as the earth is below heaven, that's how far Tartarus is below Hades. So it's a pretty, <laughs> a pretty dark place. I don't know anything mo else about it except I don't want to go there. It does happen to be the specific place in which the fallen angels in Genesis 6 are incarcerated and released for, apparently released in uh, Revelation 9. So it's a very specific place of holding these um, uh, uh, mischievous a uh, fallen angels are in Tartarus according to 2 Peter 2.4. So it is a term used in the Bible, but only once. We also encounter another term that's called the abuso. It's sort of related to uh, translate the bottomless pit or the abyss, and uh, this is where the beast of, Revela of the beast of Revelation uh, comes out of in Revelation 11 and Re uh, Revelation 17. It's where Satan will be bound for a thousand years in Revelation 20. He has his two cohorts, the false prophet and the the uh, political leader, both of them, when Jesus comes back, get thrown into Gehenna. But Satan is bound for a thousand years in the Abuso. At the end of those thousand years, Satan will be released for a little season before he's done away with and put into Gehenna. And so, but it's also, the Abuso is also the place from which the demon locusts emerge in Revelation chapter 9. And that's why uh, there could be a relationship between the Abuso and Tartarus, but that's inferential. We're not sure. We want to be cautious as we jump to conclusions here. Another way to help summarize all of this for you, let's talk about the underworld as a group as it's conceived, at least in the Greek model, and we'll use the term Hades to describe this underworld. There is a place of torment for the unsaved where they go. There's another place in Hades that is dubbed by the, uh, uh, the passage in, uh, in uh, Luke 16 as Abraham's bosom. It's the, pla the, the, the compartment of Hades where the saved go. And between these, there's an impassable gulf. All this is explained in Luke 16, which we'll explore here in a minute. Most of what we understand about this comes from the description in Luke 16. There's also the abuso, the bottomless pit, as it shows up. That is, it may be associated some way with that impassable gulf, we're not sure. And the word Tartarus may also be related some way to this and or the, the, the pit and also the gulf. But that's the perspective of the underworld. And uh, as most, uh, most scholars recognize, when Jesus was crucified, during those three days before his resurrection, he visits the underworld, declaring his victory, and apparently he takes the, those that are in Abraham's bosom with him to paradise. And so uh, that's the uh, we we believe that every when a Christian dies, he is immediately with Christ. So the, the the role of Hades in its traditional sense is no longer operative to those that are in Christ, and uh, those that are there will ultimately be cast into Gehenna in, in, in the, uh, the closing chapters of the book of Revelation. But let's take a look at Luke 16, because there's much, that, much here to glean. Uh, Jesus, in Luke 16, describes, he says, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously, sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, he was laid at his gate. That implies he was, he was uh, uh, somehow crippled. Uh, Lazarus, he has a name, Lazarus. It's the Greek form of the Hebrew name Eliezer, which means God is my help. And so it's interesting, a contrast shows up here 
We don't know the name of the rich man, but we knew, do know the name of the, uh, uh, of the beggar named Lazarus. And there's several reasons to emphasize his name. First, Jesus is demonstrating that it really happened. This was not a parable or some kind of rhetorical device. It was a description of an actual event in history. Uh, in parables, they never have names. They're just idiomatic. The rich man likely did not know the man's name, but Jesus did know his name. His name was Lazarus, and Jesus calls our attention to that. Lazarus was apparently sick because, and possibly crippled because he was laid at the rich man's gate. We want to glean all we can from this narrative which is uh, given to us by the Lord himself. It continues, verse 19, And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. That's, the, that's Lazarus' dream, was just to have some crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Okay, so the, 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 they both apparently are in Hades or in Sheol in the Hebrew. The main point here is that death is not the end. It is the beginning of a whole new existence in another world. We need to grasp that. We need to take that seriously. And in fact, um, we need to take it very seriously because this little parenthesis that we live in is a parenthesis in a much bigger picture. And we need to understand that uh, our destiny in the bigger picture will derive from what happens here and now. That's the whole point of all of this. Lazarus was righteous, not because he was poor, but because he depended on God. The rich man was not condemned because he was rich, but because he didn't use his resources properly. And Abraham was among the wealthiest people in the world of his day, yet he was not in torment in Hades. He's the idiom for the good place. The, the, the good guy went to in Abraham's bosom is the point. There we begin to see that, that partitioning, if you will. So the rich man is in, in, in Hades, and he, in, in, in Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now again, the word hell here in the English is the word Hades in the Greek. And Abraham's bosom becomes an idiom, of course, for the place of paradise for Old Testament believers at the time of death. That's, that's the concept here. It's important to understand that the rich man was conscious. He could see, apparently, he was aware of what was going on. And, uh, and he could see Lazarus. He was, he was conscious of him. He, they're not in the same place, but he's conscious of him. It's a different dimensionality. When uh, Dante writes his uh, Divine Comedy, uh, he, he portrays this place with a sign over it that says, All hope abandon ye who enter here. You and I have no capacity to imagine what it would be like be totally devoid of any hope. No hope at all. Theologians believe Abraham's bosom was evacuated after the cross and the resurrection. That's suggested in Ephesians 4, verses 8, to 8, 9, and 10. And Christ is described as the first fruits of them that slept, meaning, of course, the favored ones, if you will. For the Christian, death means to be present with the Lord. He says so in 2 Chronicles 5, Philippians 1, and uh, Jesus even says that to the dying thief that was next to him. This day you will be with me in paradise. For the unbeliever, death means to be separated from God's presence. Simply that. But you and I have no capacity to imagine what that means. For the unbeliever, death means to be separated from God's presence. And that apparently results in a tormented state. The rich man was already tormented when he was in Haiti. He didn't wait for Gehenna or all of that. So when he's confronted with that, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Wow. So he's conscious, he's aware, he's making a request to Abraham. We need to realize that the punishment of lost sinners is not remedial. It does not improve them. Hades and Gehenna are not hospitals for the sick. They are prisons for the condemned. 
We need to grasp that. We need to understand that, not try to wish it away some way. Well, Abraham responds to the rich man, says, Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, he goes on to explain to the rich man, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. In other words, it's an impassable gulf. The way we might explain it, there may be a totally different dimensionality, except there is communication. In other words, the rich man can see Abraham and carry on a conversation with him. And Abraham understands where he is, but they can't, even though they can communicate, they can't pass this great gulf. The word gulf there, the great gulf fixed, is cosma, which is a gaping opening, a chasm, a gulf. It comes from a, a, a form of a word meaning to gape or yawn. A huge, uh, it's, it's, impass- it's an impassable gulf. It's that simple. Now, some people, can, some conjecture that the abuso is involved in this geocentric topology. The only place where you can have a bottomless pit would be at the center of the earth. At the center of the earth, all directions are up. And, and so at the very center, the, you know, there is no bottom. The only place you can have, topologically, a bottomless situation. And so they associate the abuso as maybe part, is somehow associated with the gulf between these two regions. That's just speculation. But let's continue with um, the rich man here. He says, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him, that is Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. It's interesting that the people in Hades, apparently, have a concern for the lost, but can't do anything about it. The rich man, realizing his own predicament, aspires to having his five brethren uh, informed that they do, they, they, they don't come to this place. And it's interesting that he knew what they would have to do to avoid this predicament. He's conscious. He's aware. And, and he also doesn't argue with the appropriateness of this. He doesn't say this is unfair and all that sort of thing. The man is fully conscious. He has memory. He is speaking. He has pain. He has desires. We need to understand that. His eternal destiny was irrevocably fixed, unchangeable. He knew that what he was experiencing was fair and just. That may shock us. We have a hard time grasping that. He also knew what his brothers needed to do to avoid his own fate. They had to repent. He knew that. Wow. And incidentally, he was not yet in hell in the Gehenna sense. He was only in Hades, which is an interim uh, uh, place. Abram said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear him. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Abraham said to him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So that's his request. It's obviously turned down or uh, uh, refuted. And it's interesting, though, that there was one that went, came back from the dead by the name of Lazarus. Different Lazarus, of course. And uh, uh, we, so we have... It's interesting that the name of one that did come back from the dead was Lazarus in John chapter 11 deals with that. The response to Lazarus was that the chief priest was to plot to kill him. That's mentioned in, in that chapter before it finishes in, the, in, in uh, chapter 12 verse 10 of John. So the, Lazarus was, was, came back from the dead. Did they listen? No. They, they had to uh, kill him. They couldn't have him walking around. He was destroying their uh, religious position. Faith that is based solely on miracles is not saving faith. We need to realize that. So often we sort of expect that the result of a miracle would be to to, uh, increase faith. Faith that is based on miracles is not a saving faith. A saving faith is one where you trust God and you take Him at His word. That's what He's looking for. 
Jesus spoke more of hell than of heaven. Hell is real. It should preempt all of our other priorities. There isn't anything that is more uh, preemptive in your life than your posture vis-a-vis your destiny. Where is it? Where is your destiny? And how do you know? That's something you don't want to have any doubts about, you want to study and understand. C.S. Lewis made an interesting remark. He said, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. You're not going to run into a sign that says you're on your way to hell. No, 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 no. You won't believe it. It's, you don't understand. Now, many will ask, probably one of the most popular questions among the unbelievers, how can a loving God even permit such a place as hell to exist, let alone send people there? Boy, does that summarize a lot of misunderstandings. In asking that question, they reveal that they do not understand two things. They don't understand the love of God, and they don't understand the wickedness of sin. Those are two things that they need to understand. God's love is a holy love, not a shallow sentiment. He is righteous. And he has to be true to his nature. Sin is rebelling against a holy and loving God. That's what sin is by definition. Rebellion against a holy and loving God. God's mercy is unobligated and sovereign. He is in charge. The incarnate God who, was, who has vicariously suffered more for man's sin than any man will personally. That's Jesus Christ, the incarnate God, the one that became flesh, has vicariously suffered more for man's sin than any man will personally. He has the right to determine the method and extent of his own self-immolating compassion. He makes the rules. God does not send people to hell. They send themselves there by refusing to heed his call and believe on his Son. And that's the message throughout the New Testament. Nobody will be in hell for their sin. They will be in hell for rejecting the provision God has made for their sin. To escape danger, one must believe in that danger. Salvation presupposes a prior damnation. Denial prevents penitence for sin. And this prevents pardon. We can't be in denial. We have to acknowledge it. That's the first step. No error, consequently, is more fatal than that of what's called universalism, which blots out the attribute of retributive justice. It transmutes sin into misfortune instead of guilt. It turns all suffering into chastisement. It converts the redemptive work of Christ into mere moral influence. Let's understand universalism, that there are many paths to God. That blots out the attribute of retributive justice. It transmutes or changes sin into misfortune instead of guilt. It turns all suffering into chastisement. It converts the redemptive work of Christ into mere moral influence. I want to be very careful not to transmute sin into misfortune. Well, that was just unfortunate. No. Is there guilt involved? We need to acknowledge it. We need to own it, acknowledge it, and he's prepared to forgive us if we acknowledge it. No error, consequently, is more fatal than universalism because it makes salvation a debt due to man instead of an unmerited boon from God. And uh, so, okay. No doctrine throws its solemn shadows upon even the most careless human life, as universalism does. The fall and eternal ruin of the human spirit is the most dreadful event imaginable. You cannot imagine a more dreadful event than the eternal ruin of the human spirit. Well, let's go on. That was all a a departure from the second verse where Jonah is calling to God out of Sheol. He says, For thou canst, can, hast, 
has cast me into the deep. In the midst of the seas and the floods compassed me about. All my billows and waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. You know, it's interesting to study the book of Jonah and realize, especially in the second chapter, how Jonah is quoting from the Psalms. There are seven specific allusions to seven specific Psalms, if you take the trouble to to unpack the details of the text. But Jonah was clearly a man of the word, which is exciting. But he continues here, "The The waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me about and about and the weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. And that word corruption is is a shakath, which is corruption or the pit. It's the word that is is, uh, uh, used of Korah's rebellion back in Numbers 16 and so forth. No, from studying the text, you can defend the view that Jonah actually died and was brought back to life. That also fits the model. If Jonah is an anticipatory model, if you will, of the death and resurrection of Christ, it would be appropriate that he died and was brought back to life to, f- to complete the model, incidentally. But Jonah sure and some downers. He went down to Joppa. He went down into the ship. He went down to the sides of the ship to sleep. He went down in the fish's gullet. He went down to the bottoms of the mountains, which is idiomatically uh, his death, if you will, down to Sheol. Then he continues in verse 7, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee and thine holy temple. That they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that uh, I will pay that, that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. That is Jonah's prayer from inside the fish. And then we have the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. Little phrase complicated issue. That fish threw him up on dry land. Verse 10. Ten miracles in this book. Ten miracles. We have that original storm, the selection of Jonah as guilty as the guilty one by Lot, the sudden subsiding, the calming then of that storm, the great fish being at the right time at the right place, the preservation of Jonah within that fish, his ejection safe and sound on dry land. We've just encountered six of the ten miracles. The biggest one in the book is yet to come. That's what the next chapter is all about. The repentance of the entire city of Nineveh. That's the one that is the the, the most uh, intensively, most provocative of all of them. And then there's the three in the last chapter that we'll deal with when we get there. But uh, why was Jonah reluctant? Let's try to understand that. He was reluctant. God called him. He didn't obey. And before we get too critical, let's examine our own lives. Have you been called by God? Are you responding to that call? How are you responding? And we need to really uh, unpack that. What other personal lessons can we learn from this whole account? There are many, if we took the time to get into the homiletics, if you will, of the book. And uh, the, key, who is the key thing to remember, who is the key person in this narrative? It's not Jonah. It's not the Ninevites. It's not the sailors. No, no, no. It's God himself. He's the one we want to understand. He's the one that we want to to really grasp. Uh, What is he like? What makes him tick? And uh, so to speak. And uh, what can we learn from him? He is the center of our focus here. And that raises the question, what's the purpose of prayer? What's the purpose of prayer? There are many good answers to that, but I'm going to suggest one to add to your list. Prayer is God's way of enlisting you in what He wants to do. And uh, He had His plan for Jonah before Jonah even took the ship, before the storm. He had a plan. And uh, so God's in control. And the prayer was His way of involving Jonah in what God wanted to do. When we pray, 
the Lord's Prayer. Technically, it should be called the Disciples' Prayer, but everyone calls it the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is really John 17, but let's stay, stay to the, the Lord's Prayer. In that prayer, we say, Thy kingdom come. Why do we pray that? What are we praying for? There's probably not one Christian in ten that understands what kingdom we're talking about there. It's a kingdom on the earth. And it's astonishing to discover that the time that we commonly call the millennium is simply the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. That there's a, that there's a kingdom. It's the fifth of a list of five in Daniel chapter 2 that's going to be on the earth. And Jesus is going to rule from it. The purpose of pro- we, we pray that to, for us to be involved in that kingdom. Purpose of prayer. God's way of enlisting you in what he wants to do. And so, and that leads to this generic thing that we never, I don't want to lose sight of. Why do Christians have trials? We went through these before. To glorify God, to discipline for known sin, to prevent us from falling into sin, to keep us from pride. These are all different. All have le- uh, roles in our growth. To build our faith. To cause growth itself. To teach obedience and discipline to equip us to comfort others. The trouble that you might be going through might be training you to comfort those that are going to yet have that same kind of an experience and to prove the reality of Christ in us. That's what they're for. And uh, finally, for testimony to the angels. And I lifted these from Hal Lindsey's book, little book, neat book, essential book, I think, Combat Faith. Your faith is your weapon in combat, in spiritual combat. And this is... Uh, this is worth really mastering. And there's probably others, but these are a good list. Well, for your next session, I'd like you to study Jonah chapter 3. And uh, I'm going to ask you, what is the greatest miracle in this book and, more, and why is it so unusual? Why is it so relevant to you today in the country that you live in? And uh, how does this chapter 3 impact the predicament of your own country. I'm an American. And Billy Graham quipped some decades ago, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Great soundbite. And why hasn't God judged America? Maybe he's starting. Everybody studies eschatology, realizes all the players in the end times are well identified in the Bible. America is not among them. Why? There's several good answers to that, one of which it may not be relevant. The collapse that's impending upon America. The judgment that may have already started in America. We need to understand it because Hosea and Amos detail it for us. And this, this uh, deals with that. We're going to touch about that, t- talk a lot about that in the next session. The next session is very much going to be a prophetic session on our day today. So with that, let's you and I bow our hearts for a closing word prayer. Father, We thank you for this book. We do pray that your purpose would be accomplished in each of our lives, that you would help each of us understand precisely what it is that you would have of us in the days ahead. We ask this, Father, that we might be more effective stewards of the opportunities you bring before us. We pray, Father, that we each might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior as we commit ourselves into your hands with no reservations whatsoever. We commit all these things into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Savior, our coming King indeed. Amen.